Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome back to the Tourism and Culture. I hope you all enjoyed yesterday's program and your evening here in Istanbul. Today we will focus on two key topics. The role of tourism in safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage and how technologies and the digital transformation can impact cultural tourism, in particular how accessibility can be promoted thanks to these tools. We will now proceed with session two, Responsible Tourism as an Ally for Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage. This session will examine how tourism can help communities to safeguard intangible cultural heritage so that practices continue to respond to the environment and provide a sense of identity and continuity. I would like to invite Mr. Eugenio Yunis, Senior Advisor to the Board of Federature Chile, and to the Board of Chilean Hotel Association and the member of the World Committee on Tourism Ethics of UNWTO on the stage to moderate the session. And also, I would like to invite session speakers on the stage. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias, bonjour, and all the equivalent in different languages. I'm sorry I don't speak Turkish. But uh, this session um, will deal, as it was announced, with uh, intangible cultural heritage, which is uh, uh, equally important as the tangible heritage, and perhaps more vulnerable to excesses in tourism. That's why we need to protect it even more strongly than cultural, than tangible cultural heritage. Um, in this session, we'll have uh, four, five, sorry, very distinguished speakers. Uh, in the first place, Mrs. Eva Strauss. She's the state secretary at the Ministry of Economic Development and Technology of the Republic of Slovenia. We'll have Mr. Ökal Ogus, President of the Turkish National Commission for UNESCO and Chairman of the Intangible Cultural Heritage Expertise Committee here in Turkey. Mr. Neville Polina, Director of the up to you, Aboriginal Adventures in Western Australia. Mr. Amitava Bhattacharya, founder and director of the Banglanatak.com in India. And Mr. Ahmed Iwaida, who is a lead urban specialist and a, the global coordinator for cultural heritage and sustainable tourism at the World Bank. So it's a very well-balanced uh, uh, team of uh, experts in their respective fields, from the private sector, from the community sector, from government, and from international organizations. We also have uh, cats invited to the session, very living cultural heritage, but uh, he or she will not speak. <laughs> now, Intangible cultural heritage is really a very important factor in maintaining cultural diversity in an increasingly globalized world. And it can help to promote mutual respect and intercultural dialogue. I liked very much the sentence that uh, Her Excellency, the President of Malta, gave us yesterday in her uh, keynote speech when she said, that sustainable tourism could be a new uh, element for diplomacy. I think that's what sustainable tourism is. And when dealing with intangible heritage, with local communities, with indigenous populations, it's precisely when tourism expresses itself as a factor of cultural intercultural understanding and leading to peace and goodwill among societies. So 
this interaction between locals and tourists can be truly transformative for both travelers and for the locals. But however, it can also be uh, dangerous if tourism is not managed in a responsible way, in a sustainable way, with respect for the local communities. Um, as a member of the World Committee on Tourism Ethics, I would like to say that some two years ago, we developed recommendations on sustainable development of tourism with indigenous communities. Uh, it is estimated that there are in the world about 370 million indigenous people worldwide living with their old traditions, ancestral knowledge, and ancestral beliefs. And the cultural heritage of these communities is a unique asset for sustainable tourism development, and it can also benefit the local communities. In these recommendations, we took inspiration in the Global Code of Ethics for Tourism, which, as it was mentioned yesterday by our chairman, Mr. Pascal Lamy, it's uh, completing 20 years of existence next year. And it will be soon converted into a convention on ethics in tourism. The code makes reference to the role of tourism stake stakeholders in protecting and respecting the cultures of indigenous people and their ancestral traditions. There are recommendations for governments, for tour operators and travel agencies, for tour guides, for the indigenous communities themselves, and also for the tourists. So I strongly recommend you, it's not here, we don't have the time to go through these recommendations, but they are very practical, and I do recommend you to look at them and to follow these recommendations in your own countries and in all types of destinations with local communities. Uh, they, you can find them in the um, web page of the UNWTO, surely. So, to start with the panel, each as it was uh, uh, the, the occasion yesterday, we'll have each, each of our team here will have five minutes, and then there will be a round of questions, and you can prepare your own questions too uh, for, the, for the second round. So I would like to invite Mrs. Eva Strauss, uh, State Secretary at the Ministry of Economic Development and Technology of the Republic of Slovenia. You have the floor, madam. So good morning, uh, everyone. I see maybe last night it was too good dinner and uh, too good wine, so we are a little bit less. But nevertheless, um, we know how important it is uh, that we share our experiences about intangible heritage, how important it is that culture and tourism really goes uh, hand in hand. And I would like to share with you with next uh, few minutes how Slovenia is doing in intangible heritage, how we are trying to do with different partners that culture is really one of the top five uh, reasons why visiting Slovenia. So um, we are aware last year we published a new vision of development strategy of Slovene tourism where we pointed out that Slovenia should be a green, active and healthy destination, a boutique destination for five-star experiences. We are aware that five-star experiences can be only shared if the local people are sharing their the habits, uh, their nature, uh, their legends with the guests and visitors. So um, we know that for five-star experience, we have to develop sustainable tourism. 
taking care that what we are having now and sharing with uh, visitors and tourists that they uh, would cherish and experience as well the people that they are coming centuries later. And that our children will have the possibility to develop their personal needs and challenges and motivation through tourism. So really, um, culture is going, um, cultural tourism through different uh, periods of time, we can share our sites, our legend, gastronomy, gastronomy with our guests. World is beautiful, it's a lot of beautiful places all around the globe, but what makes a difference is really people and the culture we are having and want to share with the guests. So uh, in Slovene tourism, we are um, aware how uh, culture is important. That's why we developed a special green scheme of Slovene tourism, where we are involving the businesses, local communities, national parks. Uh, it's about the certification system that uh, allows different partners to really behave sustainable and to share their sustainable vision also with the uh, guests and visitors. I think it's very important to, to have and to develop this dialogue of responsibility and trust and respect with uh, guests on one side and of, cor the, of course the locals from the other side. Otherwise, we really can't uh, measure our success. Um, so with this green scheme of Slovene tourism, it, uh, it's more than 75 participants already from all parts of Slovenia. And uh, this was one of the reasons that we really won some very established awards in last uh, two years, like uh, National Geographic Award of uh, last year, ITB Berlin uh, Award for Sustainability. So as um, I pointed out, uh, intangible heritage is something that defines us, uh, not only, of course, uh, as uh, tourist workers, but definitely as uh, people sharing the family heritage first and then the heritage of the region, of a country. And um, that's why the Slovene Tourist Board, which is one of the most important partners in promoting and um, leading the Slovene tourism, decided that the year 2018 and 19 are two years of uh, culture and tourism. So most of the activities in these two years will be concentrated on cultural events, on how to promote um, our uh, events, uh, culture and heritage uh, all around uh, the world. Of course, gastronomy is a very important part of uh, intangible heritage. So we are really pleased that um, together with Portugal will be the gastronomy, the European region of gastronomy in 2021. So in these two years, we already have hold this title, both uh, countries. We will really develop even more um, events and uh, dialogue with all uh, pe uh, people and businesses involved in the, into gastronomy. But the important uh, thing here is um, locality. So that you can produce local uh, food, that you know how to make good uh, dishes from local food, and then together with the stories um, presented to the guests. It's all about storytelling, but of course being very honest um, to the guest. Another thing that um, really we are very proud of, and it's a, it's a combination of uh, tradition and um, it's beekeeping. Uh, in Slovenia, beekeeping has more, few hundred years of tradition, so uh, no wonder that Slovenia suggested to the United Nations that 20th of May should be a bee day. And this year we celebrated bee day for the first time. 
And um, here yeah, on the photo, you can see uh, part of a very traditional uh, art uh, in Slovenia. This is like uh, beehives, uh, little homes uh, for our bees. And uh, with um, paintings on these uh, bee panels, we can see what the people were feeling, living uh, 100, 200 uh, years ago. But that UNESCO and intangible heritage is definitely um, the right way to go along with tourism and of course um, to keep the, the, the care for the intangible heritage. Uh, we decided to um, sign a certificate and to join UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Intangible Heritage. And uh, one of the first um, things that we put on the list, it was the Škofia Loka Passion Play. Entered uh, the UNESCO present presentative list of intangible heritage of humanity in 2016. The interesting thing about this play, which is more than uh, 300 years old, it's that they are doing it every six years in a quite little town in Škofia Loka, 12,000 inhabitants, and more than 1,500 people is involved into this play. So it's uh, something you can't really pay because it's a passion, it's their devotion to the heritage and to, um, of course, to the city and to the history they share. The next uh, on the list, uh, they were uh, current uh, walks in, 2000, in last year. So this Slovenian carnival mask, we take it when we are having big celebration also uh, around the world. But um, current um, uh, wanted to take away to uh, winter. Um, the interesting thing is that the smallest mask is really for the kids two, three years old, when they start to walk, some passionate parents, they already uh, buy this uh, mask for their kids. Again, it's a tradition, it's heritage, and it's passion. Um, so uh, the next on intangible uh, heritage list is uh, bobbin lace, uh, a strong tradition in one little uh, village town in Slovenia, which itself is on uh, UNESCO list. And uh, I'm really proud to say that from uh, last uh, week, we have uh, a new one, and this is uh, really the um, wall, um, this um, the stone walls that they are on the list and together with the multinational nomination of dry stone construction and the lace I already mentioned. And here is a big challenge for us in the next few years. So uh, Lipizzana horses, uh, how to breed Lipizzana horses. The heritage goes as far as uh, 16th century back to a little village of Lipica in Slovenia. And uh, this is our next uh, challenge for multinational nomination. So um, in Slovenia, we truly believe that, uh, to, that intangible heritage is essential for nation, for local people, for developing tourism on a way we want to develop. We must admit that the guests, that they are um, really interested in uh, UNESCO heritage, they come to the towns or cities with more respect, and it's our vision and mission really to share this uh, further on with uh, locals and with the visitors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva Strauss. Uh, we allowed her only a couple of minutes more, but not to the other gentlemen. So I would like to invite Mr. Ök Oshal August, President of the Turkish National Commission for UNESCO, and to respect the five minutes, please. Thank you. Şu müdürler. Evet, tamam. Okay. 
Teşekkür ederim. Herkese saygıyla selamlıyorum. <gülüyor> ben 2003 yılından itibaren somut olmayan kültürel mirasın sözleşme metninin hazırlanmasında uzman olarak bulundum. O tarihten bugüne de bu süreçleri takip ediyorum. Aynı zamanda üniversitede halk bilimi, kültürel antropoloji alanında dersler veriyorum. Ve bir de somut olmayan kültürel mirasın örgün ve yaygın eğitimi konusunda bir UNESCO kürsüsünün de başındayım. Bu açılardan daha çok konuyu eğileceğimi ifade etmek isterim sizlere. Tabii bu beş dakika kuralına mümkün olduğunca sadık kalarak. Burada yansıda gördüğünüz şeylere şu şekilde dikkatinizi çekmek istiyorum. Sözleşmenin metni hiçbir yerinde yani 40 maddelik bir sözleşme metnidir. Hiçbir yerinde turizm, turist veya turistik kelimelerine yer vermiyor. Ancak sözleşmenin uygulama yönergesi 12 yerde turizm, turist ve turistik ifadelerini kullanıyor. Bu ifadelerin kullanılış yerleri tamamen turizmle sözleşmenin nasıl kesişebileceğini ifade edilen, ifade ettiği yerlerde karşımıza çıkıyor. Ee, hemen onlara birkaç cümleyle dokunmak isterim. Birincisi, sözleşmenin uygulama yönergesi, e, UNESCO'ya sunulan dosyalarla ilgili olarak, Aşırı ticarileşme ve sürdürülemez turizmi onaylamıyoruz diyor. İkincisi, sürdürülebilir ticaret ve sürdürülebilir turizm kabul edilebilir diyor. Ticari sapmayı önlemek, turizmi sürdürülebilir şekilde yönetmek gerekir diyor. İlgili toplulukların herhangi bir turizmin ana yararlanıcısı olmasını sağlamak diyor. Burası çok önemli bir ayrıntı. Turizm sürdürülebilir ise bunu sözleşme açısından uygun buluyoruz. Ancak turizmden elde edilecek gelirlerin ana yararlanıcısı o turizme konu olan mirasın sahipleri olmalıdır deniliyor. Bu çok önemli ve gerekli bir ayrıntı. Mirasın yaşayabilirliğini, sosyal fonksiyonlarını ve kültürel anlamlarının hiçbir şekilde turizm tarafından azaltılmadığını ve tehdit edilmediğini, yani mirasın kendi doğası içerisinde sürmesini sağlayacaksınız ve mirası yok edici bir etkiye sahip olmayacak turizm. Sözleşme bunu arz ediyor. Ve en önemli konulardan birisi de turist davranışlarını kontrol eden, ona rehberlik eden bir sistem içerisinde mirasla temaslarını sağlayınız diyor. Dolayısıyla turist Hiçbir, hiçbir şekilde bilgi sahibi olmadığı bir alanda tabir yerindeyse canını istediği gibi orayı kullanmasını, tüketmesini değil, ancak rehberler eşliğinde o mirasın varlığına, sürdürülebilirliğine saygı duyarak, katkı sağlayarak, destek olarak bu mirastan yararlanmalıdır diyor. Şimdi bu açılar, bu temel açılar şöyle e, sorunlarla karşısına çıkıyor e, komitenin, hükümetler arası komitenin. Tabii ki aşağıda yazdığım yerler, ee, izlediğim, takip ettiğim sonuncusu, 13. komiteyi takip etmedim. Kaynaklarından okudum. Bizzat diğerleri izlediğim komitelerdir. Söylenen ve üzerinde durulan, yani mirasların adaylık olarak sunulması veya periyodik raporların sunulması veya e, raporların diğer raporların görülmesi ve ilgili danışsal organların dikkatleriyle ortaya çıkan sorunlar kimi dosyalar üzerinden bize tekrar hatırlatılıyor. Ben bu dosyaları o dosyayla ilgili ülkelerin hangileri olduğu üzerinde durmuyorum. Ama dikkatinizi e, nelerin üzerine komitenin sorumlu alan olarak e, dikkat ettiğini vurgulamak istiyorum. Festival, müze ve benzeri mekanlar topluluk ile turisti buluşturabilir. Fakat turist için planlanan hızlı yaşam aktarımı engelleyebilir. Turizmin sürekli yenilik talebi ve zararlı etkisi mirası bozabilir. Yani festival gibi, müze gibi benzer mekanlarda turistle mirası buluşturmak daha kolay... 
Ancak diğer alanlar için daha ihtiyatlı olmanız gerekir diyor. Önemli bir konu folklorizasyon, bağlamsızlaştırma, doğasından koparma, sürdürülebilir turizm, pardon, e, e, sürdürülemez turizm ve sürdürülebilir, sürdürülebilir turizm arasındaki ilişkiyi pek çok dosyada sorguluyor komite ve sorunlara işaret ediyor. Diğer bir konu, turizmin mirası bağlamından ve doğasından koparma riski vardır diyor. Pek çok dosyada bu riskten söz ediyor. Aşırı ticarileşme ve buna dayalı turizmin miras üzerindeki tehlikesi, turizm ile kamu bilincinin arttırılması, turizmin ve aşırı ticarileşmenin olumsuz etkilerinin hafifletilmesi, unsurun turizm kaynağı olarak ekonomik sürdürülebilirliği, üzerinde duruluyor. 12. komitede artan ziyaretçi akışının akışından kaynaklanan ticarileşme ve popülerleşmeye dikkat çekiliyor. Ve nihayet son komite toplantısında yerel halkla sürdürülebilir ekoturizmi geliştirmek lazım. Sürdürülebilir turizm için yerel halk bilinçlendirilmelidir. Sürdürülebilir turizm koruma için finansal kaynak yaratabilir. Kitle turizmi ile ilgili risklere dikkat edilmelidir. Kültürel çeşitlilik ve insan yaratıcılığı için sürdürülebilir turizmi teşvik edebiliriz diyor komite. Şimdi bu deneyimleri vaktim olsa biraz daha açıp özel örneklerine girerdim ama sadece Türkiye'deki iki örneği size vermek istiyorum bu söylenenler açısından. Acaba yanınızda da görseller gelebilir mi? Ben mi getireyim? Evet burada gördüğünüz... E, bu sene 2010. yılını kutlamakta olduğumuz e, UNESCO'nun somut olmayan kültürel miras e, insanlığın somut olmayan mirası temsili listesine kaydedilmiş olan Mevlevi Sema Törenleri. E, biraz önce söylediğim UNESCO'nun dikkatini çektiği hususlar beyaz giyimli e, semazenlerin olduğu yerde burası bir e, Sema Mevlevi Hanesi e, Mevlevi Hane orada e, ritüellerine uygun bir şekilde e, sema ayini yapılıyor. Bu ayin sırasında da ziyaretçi kabul ediliyor. E, dolayısıyla ziyaretçinin ayini takip etmesinde bir engel yok. Ancak ikinci fotoğraf gördüğünüz gibi herhangi bir restoran ve bağlamından koparılmış, doğasından koparılmış, mesajından ve içeriğinden koparılmış bir e, kıyafetiyle de tabii sema kültürünün dışında birisi, Turistler için ya da misafirler için her kimse onlar için bir e, sema gösterisi yapıyor. E, bu zannediyorum ki e, UNESCO'nun e, komitesinin arzu etmediği bir koruma biçimi e, veya ticarileşme biçimi. Yani sürdürülebilir turizmle mirasın korunmasını desteklemek bu olmasa gerek diye düşünüyorum. Burada yansıda gördüğünüz e, fotoğraf ise... Kırk pınar yağlı güreşlerinden alınmıştır. O da insanlığın somut olmayan mirası temsili listesindedir. Burada gördüğünüz birinci fotoğrafta tıpkı büyükleri gibi e, hazırlanan çocuklar geleceğe hazırlanıyor ve e, kırk pınar yağlı güreşlerine yetişiyor. Yani çocukluklarından itibaren. Burada bağlamından koparmayla ilgili, doğasından koparmayla ilgili herhangi bir sorun görmüyoruz. Öbür tarafta ise e, yani festival alanı müze gibi mekanlar korumaya daha uygun ifadesini de not ederek söylüyorum. Bu Kırk Pınar Yağlı Güreşlerinin festivalinin yapıldığı alan yılda bir defa yapılıyor ve bu alan e, bir stadyum kadar büyük. Binlerce, on binlerce e, bu güreşleri izlemek isteyenler gelebiliyorlar. Dolayısıyla hem ziyaretçiyle, hani, e, UNESCO'nun kültür faaliyetleri turistten çok ziyaretçi ifadesini tercih eder biliyorsunuz. Hem ziyaretçiyle mirasın bulunmasını hem de ziyaretçi varlığıyla mirasın sürdürülebilirliğini destekleyebilir. Başka riskler olsa da diğeri kadar değil bu risk. Dolayısıyla bu açıdan baktığımız vakit e, mirasın e, ziyaretçiyle buluşması, sürdürülebilirliği bu ikinci örnekte daha başarılı görünüyor. Birinci örnek gibi dünyada pek çok örnek var. Acaba şimdi soruyu biz yine kendimize yöneltelim. Hem turizmi e, devam ettirmek hem de yerel halk için ve miras için e, yararlı olmasını sağlayabilecek 
yöntem ve metotları hem turizm e, işiyle meşgul olanların hem de kültürle ilgilenenlerin bir araya gelerek yönergeler, talimatlar, mevzuatlar hazırlaması ve bunu sıkı takibiyle mümkün olabilir görüşümü arz etmek istiyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important points raised by you. Um, we'll invite now the first of our two practitioners of uh, uh, sustainable tourism with intangible heritage. In the first place, Mr. Neville Polina, director of the Uptuyu Aboriginal Adventures in Australia. Please, Mr. Uptuna. I use a Unadan. In my country, we say Kalia Mabu Yo, Mabu Gugujin. I mean, wish you well for the rest of the day. First off, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land that we stand on today. And I ask them safe passage for all of us back to our own home countries. Myself, I'm a grassroots tour operator. Um, I live in the Kimberleys of Western Australia. And what I'm here today about is very passionate to my heart. This is the river I live on. There you go. Me and technology, we don't work. I light you a fire in 11 seconds, no worries, with two pieces of sticks. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is my backyard. I don't want to um, have any music there because I want to talk to this. I started my tour company about 23 years ago. Um, I spent most of my life underwater as a pearl diver. When I came out of the water and I stuck my head up in the air and I looked around the land, I saw other people telling my story and making, making money out of my story. And my story was not really the story that should be told because it was totally wrong and made up. So I decided, all right, I must get out of the water. I must go and tell the people that come to visit my country the real story of my land. My company is called Up To You. It's a, um, it's a designer tour company. It's a 100, I pride myself that it's a 100% genuine cultural experience. Because when I stand on my land, I speak very strong, very proud about my culture and what my ancestors have handed down to me. But it's also important for me to express that when I leave my country, then I'm just a glorified taxi driver. And so I go and I take you to the next traditional owner. And you hear from him the passion or her the passion of what their ancestors have left behind for them. I've found this has worked very well. It gets rid of all the politics and the jealousy when you share the resources amongst the people on your land. And so for me, it's very important that traditional owners everywhere, only their voices should be heard on their land and no one else's. Because if you really want the real story, you must talk to the person who owns the story. A few things. When I started my tour company, there was only six of us in Western Australia that thought the same thing, that we have to get our story right. We were all in the Kimberleys, so we started a little organisation called CARTA, which, which stands for the Kimberley Aboriginal Tourism Association. We went to our state tourism body and said, can you help us? And they said, no, we will not help a region, but we are happy to help our state. And we said, sure, we are inclusive, not exclusive. So we had a festival in, in our capital city, invited all the indigenous people from across our state and said, hey, you want to get into tourism? Why don't we set up an organisation? See, it was very hard for us it's very hard for us who are grassroots people 
to hear other people tell our stories the wrong way. It hurts us, it hurts our ancestors. So this is why we decided to get into tourism. When we sat and talked, the state Indigenous people said, yeah, we're, we're happy to set up a state organisation. This organisation we called WAITOC, which stands for the West Australian Indigenous Tour Operators Council. Through WAITOC, we created a national conference, the Australian Indigenous Tourism Conference, and we invited our brothers and sisters from around the world to uh, come and have a look at our conference. When they came to our conference, we said, hey, why don't we talk about making a global commitment to Indigenous people? This organisation we then called WINTER. WINTER stands for the, West, uh, the World Indigenous Tourism Alliance. We had started that with uh, six other countries. Now we're 100 plus countries in less than a decade. Through this organisation, WAITOC, I eventually became the chair five years after we started it, and I was on a mission. I went to my state, I went to my state tourism body and I said, I would like to have a meeting with the chair and the CEO of this organisation. Lucky for me, they gave me the, the opportunity to sit and talk with them, and they said, what do you want? And I said, I want only one thing. I want to know what sort of history us three are going to make. Are we the ones that are going to hold Indigenous tourism back or are we the ones that are going to take it forward? They looked at me and they said, yeah, okay, we will help you. Within a few months, I then became a state commissioner for Tourism Western Australia. It was a good opportunity for these non-Indigenous people to sit in the same room with a traditional owner and see that we are reliable, we are not all drunks, we are all committed to our culture and sharing. I had seven and a half years there. I totally enjoyed it and I was able to give my state the opportunity to look at who we really are. Um, through WAITOC, they gave us just enough money to run our administration. And then they realised that we started picking up accolades outside of our own country. We were, I was leaving our country to go to other countries being recognised as, as our organisation as being recognised as uh, something very important. And it's basically, in sh it's basically shamed my government into supporting us more. And so from that they started to say, all right, well, maybe we look at Aboriginal tourism development in, in the West. Western Australia, I'm very proud of because they took it in both hands and they ran with it. And now we have about 150 Indigenous tour operators right across our state. We own our own businesses. We control our own lives. It's very important for me to say that it's hard when someone else is always dictating what you need to do when you know what needs to be done for yourself, your people and your country. So through this, excuse me, <laughs> I'll leave that, I'm sorry, I light you a fire. <clears throat> yeah, so being an Indigenous top tour operator on my land is really, really heartwarming for me because I know that I am respecting my elders by telling the true story of our land. It's not a made up story. We created this organisation, as I was saying, called Winter. Now, Winter is a, um, is a global Indigenous tourism organisation. In Darwin, the Northern Territory, we created what was called the Larrakia Declaration. And this is a set of principles that we encourage every Indigenous person globally to work under. If you take these to, the part, to your non-Indigenous partners, if they don't want to do that, we say, all right, we won't partner with those people. Thank you. I was going to say, crab hook me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neville. A very interesting, uh, real experience uh, of a pioneer in indigenous tourism, 
And now we have another extremely interesting uh, founder and director of Banglanatak.com from India, who is also a leader in this field, Amitava Bhattacharya, please. Okay. okay, so I will be pressing this when I want it. Okay. Good morning, friends. My take on this topic is intangible cultural heritage and responsible tourism actually needs a paradigm shift than that tangible heritage and tourism. Because in case of tangible heritage, you have the option to be touristic first and make a little mistake, not blunder. But in case of intangible cultural heritage, it is with people. And that's why you can actually make a blunder. So you have to be very, very careful. Because it's a village. People like you and me, we don't carry the intangible cultural heritage. It is the communities which carry the intangible cultural heritage, which Neville was mentioning. So it is important to understand that in that village, it is private, also it is public. So, and it has to be guided by the local person. So understanding the heritage, understanding people is the essence of ICH-based development. We have been working on this for 18 years and my one learning, let's not take ritual into this because it might create a blunder. So take the art and culture but be very careful with the ritual. And thirdly, I will mention that try to create festival it works, but in, please keep in mind, it's a village, artist, and art. Three together is the unit that one should look at. I would like to show you a small video, and then I come back to this. Traditional art forms are an integral part of India, and many of them are dying. Art for Life is the flagship program of Bangladesh.com. It enables artist communities to build micro-enterprises that preserve their art forms. The program started in West Bengal in 2004. Now, in 2018, it is in 24 districts and has also expanded to Goa. Across all its interventions, Art for Life has impacted the lives of 40,000 artisans and established 200 micro-enterprises. The Art for Life program delivers impact at three levels. Level one, livelihood for the individuals involved, level two, vibrancy of the village ecosystem, and level three, enrichment and preservation of the art form. To quantify the livelihood impact, we selected eight programs from these districts. And from just these eight programs, what we found was amazing. The number of earning individuals has grown eightfold, from 550 to 4,850. Their average monthly income, too, has grown tenfold from rupees 700 per month to more than rupees 7,000 per month. And at the village level, due to increased livelihoods, migration out of the villages almost completely stopped. Festivals were now conducted with renewed fervor. And women folk among the main beneficiaries of the programs increasingly have become decision makers. At the art form level, better market linkages have encouraged innovation and investment in preserving the art form for future generations. Youth are joining the program and reducing the average age. In Baul, for example, the average age has reduced by 10 full years, from 50 years in 2004 to 40 years today. Six handicraft villages have now got geographical indication status, establishing them as a unique brand globally. Tourism is now an integral part of the program. In 15 Art for Life marginal villages, from no visitors in 2005, there were 60,000 visitors in 2017, including 2,000 from abroad. 1,000 of these stayed overnight. These are the village festivals which have been created and calendarized. I think two things are very important in this. Here, the focus need to be, for all the planners, invest in people. That's an essential part. Build the capacity of the communities, link them directly to the market, do exchange collaboration. 
to get two things right, socioeconomic improvement and bring pride to the village and the artists. And that will help the art form to grow and also bring visitors to these places. And this has worked. You know, anyone can actually, in any country, any region, can plan a small pilot. But it will not be done in six months. It will take three years. Take five to ten villages where they have traditional art and culture and develop a pilot for three years and then roll it out in the next seven years. 2030, the sustainable development can actually have a true agenda on cultural tourism and this, using your strong traditional culture that you already have. It's very important to understand sitting in 2018, December, that inclusive development is not an option, but is a must. And this is a true way, celebrating culture, taking people into it and allowing them, helping them, facilitating them to be part of the global growth. And that works. Ladies and gentlemen, I must mention here that I'm an engineer from IIT Kharagpur, where I learned that if process is good, product will be good. Then I went to London School of Economics where I learned that research is not about what, but about why. I worked in Silicon Valley for 10 years and I understood innovation makes business. Keeping all the three, my suggestion, earnest request to all the planners that people's culture is a wonderful thing if we play it right. But it is important also to understand that peace is not a product, it's a process. And here, taking inclusive development, using people's culture, is probably the way for peace tomorrow. I have some brochures and music CDs outside. One can take it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Amitabha. I think uh, that's an excellent example of, of supporting local communities and make them owners of their own intangible heritage. And to close, we'll have the view of uh, uh, the World Bank, and uh, we have with us, uh, sorry.